Good evening. This is Eugene May. I am the teacher of Eagle's Wings Ministry located in Dover, Florida. And I invite you to stay on this particular channel until we finish this 30 to 35 minute teaching tonight. I have been teaching a series of faith. We've been talking about faith. We've ta been talking about releasing our faith and believing God for his promises. But tonight I want to talk about faith's cooperating powers. And so I invite you to get your Bibles. I invite you to look with me into the scripture as we talk about these cooperating powers of faith. I want to take you first into the book of Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, beginning at verse 11, it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope till the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's quite a verse of scripture to me. He says, I am praying, I am ministering this word to you who want to walk by faith. You who that find themselves hoping for things to change in their lives. And so here we are, we're wanting things to change. We have that living hope within us. The Bible calls it a lively, a lively hope. And so we have that hope within us. And so I don't want to see anyone, I don't want to see even myself become sluggish, but I want to imitate. I want to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. And that is a part of why we teach this word is because we want people to imitate what God has put within his word. I'm not talking about creating an imitation, but I'm talking about imitating and acting like it. My definition of faith has been for many, many years, faith is just acting like God told you the truth. So I'm going to imitate what God has said in his word because his word is truth. Now, another scripture I'd like for us to look at, and we have already looked at this somewhat in our last teaching. It's Mark 11, verse 24. I love Mark 11 because it really gives us the formula of faith. I've, I've already mentioned to you that I am not so much into formulas, but I am into faith. But when God gives a formula, then we can find it and we can walk in it and we can see his formula be used and come to pass if we choose to believe. Now, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, we ask and pray. He says, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. When we read, we'll have them, that speaks about the future. I don't really like putting things off to the future. I like for things to happen just like that. I want them to happen the moment that I pray. I want to get the, the answer in manifestation form right then. I mean, that, that's me. That's how I try to function. And I like to function. And I love it when I see it that way. But it's not always like that. This is why I am calling this teaching Faith's Cooperating Powers. Because there are three areas that we need to look at that are going to cooperate with God to bring about the manifestation of what we believe God wants to do in our lives. Now, faith is a spiritual power. 
and we who are Christians and we who believe God are walking in a spiritual world as well as a physical world. That's one of the things that I had to recognize many, many years ago when I stepped out in faith, believe in God for healing, believe in God for material things in life, the things that we need to even conduct this ministry. We are constantly believing and trusting God to do what he has promised in his book. And I thank God that he has proven himself faithful. But we realized that there are literally two worlds. There is a spiritual world and there's a physical world. And we're living in the physical world in our natural being. But we have also chosen, we who are people of faith, we have chosen to walk in a spiritual world. A spiritual world that operates by principles other than, than the natural principles in this world. You see, Satan has two primary ways to break our faith. And he's going to try everything that he can do to do it. And that begins with this primary thing of circumstances. You see, that's the first primary way that he wants to break our faith with circumstances. He causes circumstances to change. He causes things to begin to happen. And he says, well, if I make it uncomfortable enough, then these people will give up on their faith. They'll stop believing God and they'll stop believing in God. Unfortunately, that's what's happening in much of our nation and in much of the world right now. There are those who have stopped believing God for anything, including their salvation. And then many others have stopped believing that there is a God. And Satan has done that because of circumstances. And so he uses circumstances against us. Maybe someone prayed for something and it did not happen the way they wanted it to happen. Or in the time element, that they wanted it to happen. I remember years ago, because of my prophetic ministry, I've constantly given people prophetic words. And I walked into a church in the state of Illinois. I walked into that church and a lady came up to me and she said, would you forgive me? Well, I said to her, of course I forgive you, but why do you want forgiveness? She said, I called you a false prophet. And uh, I said, well, that piques my curiosity. <laughs> Tell me, why did you call me a false prophet? And she said, well, three years ago, you gave me a word and said that my husband was going to be saved. And so three years, almost three years, went by with my husband not getting saved. And she said, I finally took, in those days we were, we'd give out cassette tapes of the prophetic words that we had. Today we're doing it digitally. I can say that word tonight, by the way. <laughs> we're doing it digitally, where we record it and then send it to people via their emails. But I had given her a prophecy and she had received the tape. And she said, I finally got so fed up because I did exactly what you said to do, I thought. And I just threw the tape away. She said, I listened and listened and listened and I threw it away. And she said, then my husband got saved. The thing was, she had told other people I'm a false prophet, and that's why she was actually asking me for forgiveness. And so she says, I threw the tape away, my husband gets saved, and I go to the pastor and I say to pastor, Do, is there still a copy of that in the archives? And sure enough, there was. And she said, this time I did really what you said. See, I told him to listen to it, but I told him to do something else. I said, 
slow it down, slow enough, word for word, write it out so that you see everything that I said. Not just hear it with your ears because sometimes we will hear what we want to hear. We don't hear what's really been said. And so she said, I did what you told us to do about writing it out. And I realized that you had not put a timetable on it. You had not said that it was going to come to pass within a certain time. And I thought that's what I heard. But you didn't say that. And then she said, I realized that when my husband got saved, it was on God's timetable not mine. And so, yes, I forgave her. And I told her, that's all right, sister. You know, God, uh, God gives me strength and courage, and I don't hold grudges. In fact, I don't hold grudges. And so, anyway, the circumstance didn't change like she wanted it. And so, in a sense, she gave up on believing for that. But God was still true. God is, God is a good God. He still brought her husband to salvation. He worked out the circumstances and situations. But you see, oftentimes, the enemy uses circumstances like that to try to get us to give up on faith, on believing and trusting in God. But he also uses people. I wish that Satan didn't bug my wife and bug my children and didn't bug my friends and didn't cause them to do things that might aggravate me. I also wish that sometimes I wouldn't yield to those things and I wouldn't cause people problems myself. But I realize I live in a real world. And there are times we say things, we do things, we uh, are maybe even unwittingly used by the enemy to sow seeds of doubt and seeds of compromise. I don't want to do that. In fact, whenever I realize that I'm doing that, I know it's not intentional with my heart. But when I know that I've done something like that, I tell you what, I go to God and I say, Lord, I put that under the blood. And I walk away free. But the enemy likes to do things like that. He likes to use people to put a stumbling stone in front of other people. And so he uses the circumstances. He uses what people say and do to put things in front of us that will cause us to give up on believing God. But now I want to talk about those three cooperating powers that I used to entitle this particular message. I call it Faith's Cooperating Powers. This is the third time I've given you that particular subject. So I want to get into it. What is it that God uses in our lives when we do these things? We are cooperating with God we are cooperating with the things that he has said in his word, and we will see what God says come to pass. And I'm going to say come about to pass eventually. Why? Because I want to go back to Mark 11:24, that verse that we looked at last week, and also who we've already looked at tonight. It says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, we ask when we pray, believe that you receive them. Believe that you receive them when? When you pray. You see, I believe that that's really when the prayer is answered, the moment we pray. But things don't always get to us in that moment. I remember in the Old Testament, Daniel is dealing with a subject, and we talked about this briefly. And he's dealing with this thing where he had prayed for something to happen. And it 
did not happen for 21 days. And he said, the angel of the Lord appeared, and the angel of the Lord said, I was sent from God 21 days ago, but I didn't get here until today because Satan fought me. He wanted to hinder the work of God. Now, you may have questions about that. I don't understand everything that I even believe in the spiritual realm. But I believe that Satan fights against us. And there was a heavenly battle that went on for this situation that Daniel the prophet was in. Now, having said all of that, it says we shall have them. We will have them. That is the thing that we're looking for. But that will have, not at that moment, but in the future, points to the very things that I want to talk about right now. You see, the three cooperating powers that I'm talking about is number one, patience. Number two, long-suffering. And number three, endurance. Patience, long-suffering, and endurance. You say, well, I thought all of those things meant the same thing. That if you have patience, you have long-suffering, and you will endure. Well, I think they describe three different characteristics that need to be in our lives. Let's talk about patience. You see, patience has to do with circumstances, with situations, with difficulties, things that arise in life. And sometimes, of course, those things involve people. But we need to be patient in our actions, patient in our conduct, patient when we deal with circumstances and with situations and difficulties in this world. I believe that if we will wait patiently in certain things, we will see the enemy give up. Because he'll say something like this, well, I can't wear Eugene down. I just can't wear uh, Beth down. I can't wear Dan down. I can't wear Bob down. I can't wear Sherry down. I can't wear them down. So he gives up. But we have patience in the midst of difficulties and situations. We also have what I call long-suffering, and the Bible talks about long-suffering. But I've discovered something over the years that long-suffering really deals with our response to people. You see, people can come against us. What are your actions during times of mistreatment by people? When people condemn you, when people talk against you, when they speak your name with derision, what happens? What goes on? Do, do you want to defend yourself? You know, sometimes <laughs> we say, well, I don't defend myself, nobody else will. But I want to tell you that God is looking for those who will say, I put it in the hands of God. I put people in the hands of God. I try to. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I've been perfectly victorious in all of these things. I'd love to. But I'm a human being like you. And I have not been perfect in all of my ways in dealing with people. And there have been some times that I've talked back. There have been some times that I've had to go to God and say, God, forgive me because I said this and this and this concerning that person who was attacking me. There have been some times that I've had to go to the person and ask them to forgive me because of how I reacted. 
And I've discovered this. I've discovered that if I have to go to someone and ask them to forgive me and they say no, I'm not going to go away broken because of that. Because I went in good faith. And I'm going to receive that it's taken care of. And from that point on, it's in their ballpark. It's in their lap. They decide what they're going to do with my apology. But I have to go. I have to do those things. Why? Because I want my conscience clear. I want everything clear. I don't want to, every time I see their face, have an ill thought about them. And so I forgive and I will tell people, for, ask people to forgive me if I have come against them. And then I have tried and I have been pretty successful at this and I'm going to thank God for that. It's not me, me alone, it's God working in me. And I have tried to forget and walk away so that when I see that person again, I don't remember. There's a song that someone wrote many, many years ago that talks about that. It's called Bitter Persuasion. I believe it was recorded by a group called Dogwood. And I would encourage you to go to YouTube and go and look up Dogwood and look up that song, Bitter Persuasion, and listen to it. It says, is there someone in the world you cannot love? A wrong has been done and it's been so long since you rested. And every time you hear their name or see their haunting face, your peace goes away. And peace, or, 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 and, and, and bitterness takes its place. I've forgotten all of the words. I'm just doing that from my memory. But I want to tell you, that song years ago came into my heart. I wish I could remember all of the words right now. But the idea is that I walk away from it. And when I look at that person, and when I think about that person, I don't think about all the problems that we have. Someone asked me not long ago, how is it that you're able to walk into the presence of someone who has attacked you or said something terrible about you, and, and it seems like you don't even let it phase you. You greet them and you hug them and you tell them, you know, I appreciate you, and things like that. I want to tell you the way it is. When someone breaks a relationship with me, I don't put a period at the end of the sentence on that relationship. I keep it open. And I keep it open for one thing, so that if I meet them, if I see them, I want everything to be as it was before there was a problem. And I believe that God has given me that grace. And so that's a part of what it means to be long-suffering, where you're willing to put up with things, with people. See, patience deals with circumstances, situations, difficulties that come in our lives. But long-suffering deals with people. And so if I'm in a situation and it's people that are giving me problems and I need to have faith to come through that, then I'm going to let my long suffering come into effect. But there's a third cooperating power that I need to talk about. And this third power is simply this, endurance. Sometimes we want to put the word endurance and patience to mean the same thing. I believe endurance is different because endurance is what I call your holding power in the midst of the situations that you're in. You're holding power where you hold on to the things of God. You see, during times of prolonged stress, your endurance is tested. And God says, I'm going to bring you through. 
you're, if you'll hold on to me and you'll hold on to my promises. I've watched that in my own life. There have been times that I was attacked physically with those difficulties and circumstances and situations that I talked about when I talked about patience a moment ago. I've been attacked physically. And I decided I've not given up. I'm holding on to God. I'm holding on to His promise. I'm holding on to His word. And that's the thing that has kept me in line. The fact that I was willing to hold on to His promise. I remember when the doctor said to me in 1996 that cancer is spread all through your body. That was not a good word. But God had given me a word. God had spoken to me in the little town of Iberville, Quebec in Canada one month before. He had spoken a prophecy that I did not even like. The guy that gave me the prophecy was one of the leaders in Spirit-filled church in that town. And on the last service, we'd been there from a Sunday morning to a Sunday night whole week. And on that last Sunday night, this man spoke to me and he said, I was about to go through the greatest trial that I, ever, that I ever had. It would be a matter of life and death. I didn't like that. But then he said to me, but you shall not live, you shall not die but live, excuse me. You shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Well, I could receive that part, but that other part I didn't receive. I went to, from Canada to the States and then went to South America. And on the last Sunday that I was there, I noticed something was happening in my body. I was bleeding. When I got home, I discovered that I had colon cancer. The doctor did what he could do, and at first he said, well, I think we got everything. And then a few days later he comes back and he says, no, we didn't. That cancer spread through your body. Well, by that time I had realized that the prophecy that I had received was exactly right. And I was holding on to that. In fact, his words did not faze me because, you see, we had already prayed a prayer of faith. We had already made a decision to hold on to what we had received from God. You see, I believe endurance is very, very necessary sometimes in our lives. We endure. Sometimes we endure hardships. Oh yes, that was a hardship. But I tell you, in a few weeks they couldn't find the cancer and it's been since 19... 96, no cancer. Why? Because we held on to God. We endured even the evil report. The Bible teaches us in the book of Psalms that we are not to be upset by evil tidings or evil reports. In the middle of it, we endure. We stand fast. We hold on to the things of God. You see, Correct action in difficult situations and proper response signifies what our faith is. And so I want to encourage you as we come toward the end of this particular message on faith, I want to encourage you to let patience have its perfect work within you. But not only let patience, but have long suffering concerning the people that are around you. And then exercise endurance. Stay by the stuff. Don't turn, don't turn things loose because you're having difficulties. God wants you, yes, to have patience and long suffering but also to have endurance in the middle of whatever it is that may be happening in your life and in your circumstance. Some of you right now tonight 
are experiencing physical difficulties. You may be sick at this moment. You may not be able to work. You may not be able to walk. You might not be able to do anything for yourself. I believe God knows how to heal you. There may be those that are having financial difficulties. I believe God knows how to bring you through those and answer the questions that you have in your life. There may be those who are having difficulties with family members because their family members are not saved, they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, and, and you have come to a place of really giving up. No, no, we're going to hold on to the faithfulness of God. We're going to believe God. I want to pray a prayer of faith with you. You see, God's Word is true. The Word of God that He has given us is a Word that He wants every one of us to believe and to receive His promises. So we're going to pray a prayer of faith right now. We're going to come to God with Mark 11, verse 24. I want to read it again. It says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to pray a long prayer. It's going to be a short prayer. I don't think prayer is judged by its length and flowery words. So this is my prayer for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to those who have been listening to this word and watching this video. I pray, Father, that you will touch them. If it's sickness in any way, Lord, you heal them. If it's financial difficulties, Lord, you meet the need. If it's family difficulties and circumstances, Lord, you touch those family members. Lord, we put all things into your hands and we lay claim upon your promises, O God. Lord, you said that all of the promises of God in you are yes. And when we say amen to the promises of God, what we are doing is agreeing with you. And Lord, we know that that agreement is perfect. And Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name that you are doing all things well in our lives. Amen. Well, that's our faith message for tonight. We're going to continue in our next teaching, talking about faith. We may even talk about faith cooperating powers a little bit more because, you see, there's some other things that we need to say about it. So I'm going to say God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll be seeing you in a few days. Bye-bye.